have to begin by, with a confession. It's always good to confess your weaknesses and your difficulties before you get, embarrass yourself by not coping very well with any situation you're in. And here is the, the fact of what I'm about to confess. I'm standing here before you with no Bible, no order of service, no idea of what's going to happen <laughs> because I've left everything in Dumfries. <laughs> now that's quite a shocking sort of situation to find oneself in. At the same time, it throws me back to all the years in Zambia when I hardly ever had anything written, where I read the praise and I only had to know the first line because everybody then <laughs> just opened their hearts to the Lord and praised them. And and I was always quite at peace being just like this in front of the congregation. But right now at the moment, you may know I've got a problem with my legs. At the moment they'll hardly support me because I feel like fainting and fading away. So that's the confession time over. And I've nothing to give, nothing to feel sorry about in terms of our opportunity to be here in fellowship, in the presence of the Lord, seeking to honour all those who have gone before us whose lives are marked in this place. We've been here before through the years from time to time and we've been encouraged to pick up the threads of the conventicle and uh, once again meet together in this way at Dalgarnock. The last time we met as a congregation was in 2015, it's not that long ago, just a few years. <coughs> Uh, and it was a, a, a time of great blessing at that time. At the moment, I'm kind of playing for time because I'm trying to get the orders of service that you would have been able to get the words from the hymns from. And uh, they may appear. I've sent out messengers in all directions <laughs> to see if we can uh, put right the situation. But in the meantime, my intention is to invite, at this moment, two of the folk who have offered to be involved in the service, but one of them particularly has been quite involved in preparing for this day. Helen, who's sitting over here, she has, uh, I was going to say twisting a few arms, uh, but I think she's more gracious than that. But she did approach the council and they uh, out, went out of their way to make this place uh, fit for worship. They've cleared, cut the grass and cleared the place Otherwise, we would have been standing knee-deep in grass at this anywhere in your city. So that's an amazing thing. And uh, likewise, Helen has been good enough uh, to encourage Jack here to become involved in the service. Now, they were going to be taking part later on. They didn't know it, but I had to put them into the order a wee bit further on. And what's going to happen now is I'm going to ask each one of them in turn to come and to share briefly with you. We're not just playing for time, we're making the best use of our uh, the resources available to us and making the best use of those who are present with us. And in due course we'll begin our praise and in due course we'll maybe get a bit of help. We'll certainly need it from above, but we may even get some help from the priest. Heavenly Father, you're the one who's watching over us at all times in the good times and in the times when things become difficult. And so we look to you at this time, in all our weakness and all our frailty, knowing that you love us with an eternal love and that you've shown us that love in Jesus, your Son. We pray, Lord, for the presence of your Holy Spirit, the Comforter, our strength, our peace and joy, experiencing all your blessings by your Spirit's presence. Let your spirit descend upon us now and bless us as we meet together here in fellowship, remembering those who honoured you in giving their lives and living their lives to your glory in their day, as we seek to do in our day. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Helen, would you be good enough to come? share with us and then introduce Jack. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome. 
I'd just like to share with you that this wonderful, you know, bringing back this conventicle started actually before COVID. It started before COVID. A very dear friend of mine, whom, who is known as Dunhamer, and I came to visit Dogarnock. And at that time, Dogarnock was shrouded in, it was like a wilderness. It was shrouded in long grass and you could see this monument, this, this was good. And this part of the graveyard doesn't get quite so cluttered with, uh, with weeds because it's, you can see it's clearer. But generally the place had an air of uh, neglect. And we had a discussion about how it kind of was consistent with the feeling that we had that our covenanting heritage is a little bit neglected too. And we chatted a bit about how the covenanters for Christians, they're a tremendous example of what it means sometimes to take a stand on something that's really important. Through what the covenanters did, we believe that the covenanters brought us a lot more than the freedoms in faith which they brought. They certainly brought that. They separated the crown from the Scottish church system forever. And they also uh, brought freedom of speech and the right to conscience and the right to take a stand and think differently from the crowd. And these are all wonderful values that have become part of democracy. But remember, when the, when the Covenanters were, were here, that was 1640 to 1679, I believe, at that point in time, the Covenanters, uh, we did not have any democracy. So to stand up and say to the crowd, no, we will not worship you, we will only worship Jesus Christ, keep you, right out of our church affairs. That was a very, very strong and bold and courageous thing to do. And I think what I'd like to share with you is that that period of history should, uh, just the same as we want to have a lovely sanctuary here and in other parts of our wonderful land where covenanters uh, are, are, are lying uh, in a sacred spot, um, we feel that the history is something we should be proud of and it should not be buried away. So we had that conversation, Dunhamer and I, and Dunhamer then said to me, you know what he said, I want to try to get this place cleaned up. So, you know, I'm one of these people, I'm very good at talking, but I'm not necessarily good at seeing into what's possible. But Dunhamer was the one that brought the vision into this situation. He said, listen, I want to get this going. He said, we must clean this place up. We must clean the graves. We must just make it something dignified and respectful for our forefathers. And so Dunhamer started that process. That was at the beginning of lockdown. Uh, he got a certain way with it. He got as far as getting in touch with the council. And for those of you who might have had dealings with any officials, at this point in our history, you'll know that money is so scarce and budgets are so slashed that what looks simple is not necessarily at all simple. <laughs> so that's how it all started. And then, as it happens, Dunhamer had, uh, has had health and other uh, social circumstances which have not allowed him to continue to be hands-on with all of this. But I could, would just like to thank him and so that share it with you, this truth, which this came from Dunhamer. He has inspired and encouraged everything that's arisen since that time, both in relation to Dog Arnock and other related uh, projects which are going to come from this. We're hoping uh, to, to be able to do lots more. Uh, and as they unfold, I'll tell you about them. I'm one of these people that prefers not to talk about something until the until the reality is in front of us. <laughs> I should perhaps have more faith in it, Reverend. So that's the background to standing here in Dalgarnock today. That's the background. 
thinking specifically about the few words I'd like to share with you, which are poetic or from poetry, I would also like to share with you that from childhood I've carried these words in my own heart. That's because as a little girl, my dad, who was a reverend, uh, used to take to the hills with the stonemason Mr. Stoddart, who's one of the founding members of the Memorial Association organization, but this was pre this time, we're talking early 60s. I was the child and my dad and Mr. Stoddart were the workers. And we'd go and find uh, specific uh, stones in the heather. And I had the joy of being able to go and look for wildflowers and be carefree. Sometimes my brother would join me while the, the, the men worked. So I'm just, it's such a lovely part of my childhood memory because when I look back, I've still got some of the flora from that time in my Bible, and that's from the early 60s. I've never tried to move it because I'm sure it would probably fall apart. <laughs> <laughs> but that's my background, and that's, I have a passion for this part of our Christian heritage, partly through that joyful memory. I'd also like to share with you that the particular poem I want to read uh, also has an association with um, being a comfort to myself in that I lived away for a long time. I lived in Africa for a very long time. And there were just times in my life when I would think of home. I, you know, home can be, your mind can play, play tricks with you. Home isn't necessarily what, home is what you want it to be, but isn't necessarily where you feel okay. But I always felt okay when I read this little poem and I reminded myself of the words because it's all about being connected to something precious which is the southern uplands of Scotland and the, where the marchers were hounded but where they uh, belonged. The third comment I'd make about my connection to this poem, my particular connection, is that uh, there are times in life when you've got to remember what your faith is. And when I think of the words of this poem and what the Covenanters stood for and what they did, I always think, you know, the Covenanters and the Christian faith, it's all about supporting each other and loving each other. It's all about the trust, the great trust that must have been between all these men, being hounded, being, being uh, at risk of death for many years, the trust between each other that must have built up, the reliance on other people to give them food and shelter. So it's about love and trust, and it's also about standing firm on anything that really matters because it's what Christ asks us to do sometimes and that's what they did and as they died they had no idea of what of the good they were doing into the future they had no idea but they gave their lives there were something like 1800 covenanters taken to the gallows in Edinburgh and um, murdered at the gallows. Well, they weren't, they didn't call it murder, they called it, you know, legally speaking, they were killed. And there were thousands uh, sent to America, because as I've been researching for this, uh, I've connected with some of the um, uh, descendants. Of course, the American folk, are, especially the Christian folk, are very proud of any of their heritage. And it's wonderful to talk to people that know so much about the Covenanters and there were thousands, not hundreds, thousands. And of course that would influence the culture in America, wouldn't it? And it, would, it would influence their value system as well, which is, there's always wonderful benefits in Christian uh, uh, activities, even from uh, dire situations, as we know, you know. So I just wanted to share these things with you over and above all the Covenanters that lived in these hills, that fought these battles, and who eventually won 
albeit they mostly fell in great humility and didn't know that they had won. So, having said these few words, I would just like to ask you to pause, as I will, and if you know these words, please say them with me. If you don't, I hope that they will touch your heart. They're the words of Robert Louis Stevenson when he was in Samoa towards the end of his life and when he knew he had reached his, his last time on this earth. He was dying and he was thinking of home. And the words go, the poem is called Blows the Wind, Blows the Wind. It's only because I'm anxious I'm referring to my books. <laughs> Blows the wind and the sun and the rain are flying. Blows the wind on the moors today and now. There, about the graves of the martyrs, the whops are crying. My heart remembers how. Be it granted me to behold you again in dying, hills of home, and to hear again the call. Hear about the graves of the martyrs, the whops crying, and hear Nemeir at all. Jack could be all upon you to share with us. <laughs> well, who am I going to call tonight? <laughs> Can you all hear me? That's uh, the main point. <coughs> <coughs> Speak to that bloke away at the back there, that big tall fellow. <laughs> you know, David. Address it all to him. <laughs> Well, I'm with the Covenanters uh, Memorials Association. Uh, the company that cleans up the, the memorials and uh, repairs the memorials and carries out all the work over the various uh, cemeteries and uh, moorlands throughout uh, Scotland. And uh, <coughs> I don't have any more of the association here today. I don't see faces that I know amongst them, but, uh, oh, <laughs> there's one, so I'm not alone, oh, two. <laughs> so I've been asked to uh, say uh, a poem, actually, it's a poem. Now, one of the main uh, sacred things of, of the church, uh, in all our churches, is uh, the communion service, the time of communion. And uh, these uh, hardy, sturdy souls uh, held many conventicles round here and all over the southwest of Scotland and the heather, amongst the heather and the moors. And uh, even with the death sentence hanging over uh, their heads, these dauntless followers of Jesus Christ met to hold the Lord's Supper in the most dire and fearsome circumstances. They employed watchers in the hilltops to watch for Claverhouse and his dragoons, and uh, they, they kept an eye open. And the, the priests to thousands, thousands attended these uh, conventicles. Uh, I attended one place where a conventicle was held in person where 7,000, 7,000 came and attended that communion service. And the preachers was William Beach from the priest St. Michael's and uh, John Blackadder of Taquia and uh, another one from Dunbar. 7,000 people attended the Lord's Supper at that uh, conventicle. As I say, with the, the sentence of death upon their heads, with the dragoons, uh, came, upon them, <coughs> came upon them. So today I would like to uh, say this poem 
I've called it a Covenanter's Communion. Covenanter's Communion. And no more the assembled people there in face of day worship God. <clears throat> or even at the dead of night, save when the wintry storms raged fierce. And thunder peals compelled the men of blood compelled the men of blood to couch within their dens. Then, dauntlessly, the scattered few would meet in some deep dell, or rock or canabit, to hear the voice, the faithful pastor's voice. And he, by the light of sheeted lightning, lightning opened the book, the sacred book, and words of comfort spoke. The word of God was proclaimed in such circumstances. The word of God by common thundered, or by radic poured in gentle streams. Then rose the psalm, the loud acclaim of praise. The wheeling plover ceased her plaint, and the solitary place was glad. And on the distant cairns, the watcher's ear caught the doubtful at times the breeze borne note. The sermon ended and the tables were fenced, while the elders brought the sacred symbols forth, and the day's more solemn uh, service now commenced. To heaven is wafted the devotion's wing. The psalm, those entering the altar, sing. I'll of salvation take the cup. I'll call with trembling on the name of Zion's king. His court shall enter at the footstool fall. My friends, how dreadful is this holy place. Where rolls the thickening thunder, God is near. And though we cannot see him face to face, yet as from Horeb's mount, his voice we hear. The armies of the upper sphere, down from these clouds on your communion gaze. The spirits of the dead who once were dear are viewless witnesses of all your ways. Go from this table then with trembling, tune his praise. Thank you. Heavenly Father, as we consider the past looking to those who have gone before us, those who having signed that covenant, acclaiming Jesus, the sole head of the church. We thank you that you have developed their work through the years. But in our generation, Lord, many of us are lost, many are without an awareness of the love that you have for them. And so we simply pray that as we gather here, we ourselves may be encouraged, that we may be blessed, that we may be made aware of the love that continues to flow from your heart to the people of this land. Thank you, Father. Amen. Now, somebody's laid a case beside me here. I'm just opening the check to before they brought it. <laughs> it's going to have the morning service in here. So let's hold our breath a moment and see what happens. It looks not bad. I'll tell you what was about to happen before that came.
We're about to sing the 23rd Psalm because I can do that by heart. <laughs> and I'm sure you could also join in. But as it is, we'll turn now to what was arranged in this, in this order of service. And I simply pray that you'll join with me as we sing Psalm 100. All people that on earth of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth, shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. In Psalm, reading from Psalm 2. Why do the heathen rage, and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, and against his anointed saying, Let us break their bands asunder, and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh, the Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath, and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost part of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun, 
lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. May God add his blessing to his reading of his most holy word. Amen. 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 Psalm 121. I to the hills will lift mine eyes, from whence doth come my aid. <coughs> I to the hills will live my eyes broken. I to the hills will live my eyes from whence doth come my aid. My safety cometh from the Lord, who heaven and earth hath made. Thy foot heal not less light. Genesis, the clerk to the board, a close one. Jesus prays to be glorified. After Jesus said this, he looked towards heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come, glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you, for you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life that they know now, you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Jesus prays for his disciples. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. Amen. The Psalm number 103, for with all my soul, bless God of God. Oh, Lord, my soul, bless God the Lord, and all that in me is, be stirred up his holy name, to magnify and bless. Bless, O oh my soul, the Lord my God, and not forget Thank you. 
diseases, all and pains, doth heal and be relieved. Who doth redeem thy life and love, to death may not who thee with loving kindness doth, and tender mercies come. Who with abundance of good things dost satisfy thy heart, so that he has the eagle's age renewed his eyes. Commenting, I hope very briefly, on the readings we shared this afternoon. In Psalm 1, it's considered as one of the wisdom psalms. Wisdom coming from the Lord. It celebrates the joyful blessing of those who set themselves to fulfill God's law. And the importance of obeying and honouring the law in all our prayers in all our service. Obedience to the law is a joyful response in love to God's gifts given in love. It teaches us how to remain close to God. It's a revelation of God's nature. Obedience in a sense is a matter of the imitation of God. We know that many years later Thomas Akempis wrote of the imitation of Christ one and the same. The theme song of the law, be holy as I am holy. This is a quotation from the book of Leviticus, one of the books of the law in the Old Testament. Be holy as I am holy. I've often said in the congregation that one of the most uh, meaningful uh, concepts of holiness is the concept of being different. Holy is, God is holy. God is essentially different. And yet, he identifies with us in Christ Jesus. And we are called to be holy. We are different. We are different from the world. We have been transformed by the love of Christ. Words like transform, of course, change their meaning through the years. And in these days, it's rather sad to find some of these conceptions are being turned into almost as if you can transform physically. We are made as we are made by God, our Creator, Father. And in our transformation, it's the reaching of Him into the depths of our being and an awareness of our relationship with Him. This psalm exhorts a blessing on those who stand apart from others as they delight in the law. The law is not a burden. It's a pleasure. If Just for a moment, if you could run through in your mind the, the Ten Commandments, for example, and recognize that they begin with the centered and based on the reality of God's presence and who he is. It moves on to make it clear that, that that is developed and enhanced and fed by worship, honouring the Lord's day, honouring that time that we set apart, which again is holy, which is different. And so through all the commandments, right to the greatest commandments, to love the Lord our God with all our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength, I don't miss any of them out and our neighbours as we love ourselves. The image for God's blessing in that psalm, number one, is a tree planted beside flowing waters. In a dry land, water is the very essence of life. And not every tree flourishes. Quite strange, the other day they were at a session meeting John Carpatti was telling us the, the hawthorn tree down at the end of the drive is dying. <laughs> <laughs> we don't, we don't, it was put in there by somebody as a memorial. 
and that it's drying up. You wonder how is it drying up in a season like this? But things come in to the into into God's creation that spoil it in a way, and we hardly we hardly can understand and know what these issues are, and even the things that affect our own our own lives, and how our lives are affected by so many pressures around us. You know, there's a sense nowadays that we're almost being brainwashed all the time, and and there are things that we can't break free from them because it, they're there as a kind of constant pressure on our awareness of life as it has to be, not as it has to be, but as we are called to live it today. Are as chaff blown away by the wind. The Lord watches over the way of the righteous, says the psalmist, but the way of the wicked will perish. God's people are set among nations and people whose endeavours are in vain as they stand against God and his anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ. They say, let's get free of God, cast aside, step aside from the Messiah. The one enthroned in heaven, the psalmist says, laughs at them. It's a laugh of kind of sadness. It, it's that that woeful, rueful smile, almost smiling and shaking your head as he looks upon us. And the psalmist continues, the Lord saying, I have installed my king in Zion, my holy hill. The Lord has decreed and anointed a new king, saying, You are my son. Today I have become your father. I will make the nations your inheritance, the earth your possession. And that psalm ends with the warning of the dire results of unbelief. Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem when he addressed his disciples. He was on his way to Jerusalem and to death. He has just declared to his disciples, in me you have peace. In the world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Then looking heavenward, Jesus prays intimately, Father, the hour has come. Give glory to your Son, so that the Son may give glory to you. And this word glory, it's amazing. Doxa, the first time it's talking about doxon, because it's glory that's given to the sun. The time of the second time it's used there is when the sun gives glory and reverses it. So it's a reverse tense that's used of this word glory. It's glory that's given. It's glory that returns. There's a certain shining forth. It's it's not something that touches you and, and it has no effect. Glory is the awareness of the reality of the blessing that you receive by the one who has given you life. The word glory itself has a whole stack of meanings. Some of them, I was just checking it all out. It's the appearance or the, or the attributes of honour, of praise, of dignity and majesty, of luster, of magnificence of radiance, of dazzling splendour. There's certainly nothing gloomy or sad or boring or meaningless or hopeless about it. The nature of God's Spirit touching our lives is indeed a transformation. You gave Jesus, your Son, authority over all humankind that he might give eternal life to those that you have given him. We have been given as a gift to Christ. We've come to know him, but we ourselves have made that level of commitment where we are offering ourselves as a response to what we have discovered and know of his love. Eternal life. Is eternal life, says Jesus, is knowing you. Remember, Jesus at this point is praying to his Father. Jesus himself is addressing the Father. 
Eternal life is knowing you. And this is a, again, those of you who attend the church close when you hear me, I go on about certain things quite a lot. Here's another thing I'm always going on about, and it's what knowing. Not the, the level of knowledge that is used in the scriptures is awesome. It's, it's a knowledge that is there because there's a link. It's a knowledge that is transferred because of the, the relationship that is, the, and the reality of that relationship is what will enhance and make real the knowledge that you have of life, of God, of your neighbour, of, in every respect. Eternal life is knowing you, Lord, in this intimate relationship. The only true God, the true God, the one who can be trusted. A God among many gods in this life. And knowing Jesus Christ, the Son, being in such a relationship with him that the glory is touching our lives, is inhabiting our lives. In Zambia, we had a, a, they went in for festal cries, in Shibemba usually, but here's one in English. The leader would say, Christ in you! All you've got to do is say, Hallelujah. <laughs> That's all. Christ in you! Hallelujah! Christ in you! Hallelujah! Christ in you! Hallelujah! The glory that it comes out of this relationship. I have brought you glory in earth, says Jesus to his Father God, by completing the work you gave me to do. As he lived his life in obedience to the Father, so the Father is glorified. And so Jesus continues, And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Because what we experience is part of God's purpose for us from the very beginning. From before we even came into this world, his purpose for, existed for us. His offer of glory and the beginnings, the seed of the possibility of knowing that glory is there within us. Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I have made you known to those whom you gave me out of the world. Because this knowledge, it involves taking that step out of the world. We're not anchored in it. We're not, we're not enslaved by it. We can live our lives in the world, but not of the world. Now they know that everything I have comes from you. I gave them the words of the message you gave me, and they accepted those words. The Logos, the Word of God. For these covenanters, the Word of God was of the essence of their commitment. Because their lives were lived according to God's Word. It's more than just knowing your Bible. Look at me, I've been a minister for 60, I've forgotten the number of years, 63, 65, something like that, who knows. And I entered the ministry when I know, I must have been only 62 because I became a minister when I was 30. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that much. <laughs> the fact of that knowledge, that word, which is in the scriptures, that some of us have indeed built our lives upon. It's not that we can quote chapter and verse. But we know the word because it's the reality is out working in our lives. I gave them the word of your message you gave me and they accepted it. They knew with certainty that they came from you and they believed that you sent me. Whole range of relationships that is knowledge. Accepted by our brains, not just by our hearts or our feelings. I pray for them, says Jesus, not for the world. I pray for those you gave me, for they are yours. They belong to you, Father. All I have is yours. All you have is mine. 
My glory is shown in and through them, says Jesus. His glory is seen and known through you. His glory is seen and known through you. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, the living word, the word made flesh, the word present among us as we meet in fellowship, the word that we have heard and accept this day. Thank you, Father. Do you know this psalm? Psalm 23. <coughs> with us day by day for life and health for joy and fruitful labor and blessed hours of quietness and rest for every duty that enables us to be unselfish patient and loyal one to another and for the call to be faithful in things meaningful and eternal we thank you we praise and we bless you for the love and sacrifice of Jesus Christ our Savior for his triumphant cross and his power to save to the uttermost all those who commit themselves to him by faith. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who guides and defends us, turning our hearts towards holiness and perfecting us in the likeness of your Son. Grant us grace to love you, the one who has so loved us, and to offer our lives to you in the service of your kingdom, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Loyal to the teachings of your word, we pray for Elizabeth our Queen, for all the people of her realm. Lord, bless our homes, our friends, our neighbours. We pray for the whole church of your Son upon earth, and especially for the congregations and fellowships to which we belong. We bless you for all the saints who from their labours rest. Keep us in thankful remembrance of those, the fruit of whose labours we have inherited. And at the last, unite us with our loved ones and all you redeemed in the glory of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we further pray. Our, our Father, Father, which art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now with thou may sing and that truly Holy Spirit, the Comforter, be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. 